Okay, 2.30 is upon us, so we'll go ahead and get started today. First of all, I want to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, my name is Nikki Forbingor, and I'll be moderating today. So the, to kick us off today, we're going to hear remarks from Public Health Administrator Elke Shaw Tulloch, Deputy State Epidemiologist Dr. Katherine Turner, Idaho Immunization Program Manager Sarah Leeds, and our guest, Dr. Lisa Barker, who is a pediatrician at St. Luke's Children's Treasure Valley Pediatrics in Meridian. Then we'll take questions from the media. So with that, I will turn it over to Elke. Great. Thank you very much, Nikki. Uh, hopefully you can hear me okay. Great. Had, had some updates on my computer, so I just want to make sure. So thank you all very much, uh, and welcome to our press briefing today. Today, our primary focus is going to be on children, and we're grateful to have our guest today, Dr. Lisa Barker. To begin the briefing, I would like to provide our weekly um, data overview, which is encouraging but tempered. Uh, cases are declining in all age groups and in most parts of the state, but, this, but cases continue to be at higher levels than they were in the summer and into early August. Additionally, while there appears to be a decreasing trend in North Idaho, fortunately, six of the seven counties with the highest weekly incidence rate are located in eastern Idaho, so we're keeping a watchful eye. Hospitalizations continue to decline, but the numbers of people in the hospital with COVID remains at a high enough level that continues to strain our hospitals, and we are still operating in crisis standards of care. Our test positivity is at 11.5% but it's still more than double the 5% that we like to see. Over half of eligible Idahoans have completed their vaccine series. However, we are well below the national average at just 57.8% of our population. Our adolescent and teen vaccination rates can be seen on the graph that Nikki will share. Our overall or cumulative vaccination rate among Idaho youth ages 12 to 17 who are fully vaccinated is at 33%, which you can see on that blue line. Of that, 32% of 12 to 15 year olds are fully vaccinated and 38% of 16 to 17 year olds are fully vaccinated. Those two age groups are what make up that blue line. You can see this span from February 12th when vaccines have been available for youth, and you can see depicted in yellow the second dose is administered per day. We would definitely like to see these rates even higher as we move into the holiday season to keep our kids healthy and ready to return to the classroom after our family gatherings. Thank you, Nikki, for sharing that graph. I would like to re-emphasize that we are seeing some good progress with our case rates and hospitalizations, but caution that we must continue to take measures and precautions to keep things from changing and moving in the wrong direction. This includes getting the COVID-19 vaccine, wearing a mask when indoors, and crowded outdoor events in communities of high transmission, which is the entire state except for one county, of which most, uh, and maintaining excuse me, physical distancing. Regarding vaccinations, they are safe and we know that they work. People who are vaccinated are nearly five times less likely to be hospitalized for COVID if they become infected, and they're nearly four times less likely to become infected in the first place. I'm encouraged to hear about people who are making the decision every single day to get a vaccine, even at this stage of the pandemic. I want to stress that it's not too late to get your first, your second dose, or your booster dose if you're eligible. You have the chance to protect yourself and your loved ones in time for the holidays. So this brings me to the next great opportunity for protection against the ongoing risk of COVID, which is the approval of a COVID-19 vaccine for children ages 5 to 11. Our next speakers will be discussing this in further detail. And my last note before I turn this over to Dr. Turner is that we will be changing the posting dates of our case investigation data to be Monday through Saturday. No data will be posted on Sundays because we are not receiving reports from health districts on Sundays uh, to the fullest extent, um, causing the numbers on our site to appear lower than they actually are. So we want to make sure that our data are uh, as completely up to date as possible for you. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Turner. Thank you, Elke, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to take just a few moments and talk a little bit about um, cases among idle children. And to do that effectively, I am going to um, display some data. Uh, 
Nikki, I do not have sharing permissions. Do you think you could display the graph? Oh, Nikki has all of the power and was able to give me permissions. Great, okay, I think you all are seeing a chart. Um, as you can see uh, from that blue trend line of cases reported among children each week uh, throughout the pandemic, cases among Idaho children have decreased over the last few weeks. And that's great news. Um, the flip side to that terrific news is that cases among children still remain significantly higher compared with where we were um, this last summer. And in fact, we are, we are just now getting down to the number of cases that we saw at the peak of our surge last winter. So that gives us some indication that we still need to go down quite a bit, even though we have decreased significantly. And as of Saturday, just over 250 Idaho children have had to be hospitalized for their illness since the start of the pandemic. One third of those hospitalizations have occurred in the last three months. Um, in addition, 37 Idaho children have developed a post-infection complication that's called multi-system inflammatory syndrome. This is, um, you'll see it abbreviated as MIS-C or MISC. Those cases are represented by the bars on the chart that you're looking at right now. Um, this, this syndrome, in this syndrome, different organs in the body become very inflamed, and this can include vital organs such as the heart and the brain. And the symptoms start about two to six weeks after an acute infection with the virus that causes COVID-19. So what we see is um, that the um, reports of MISC that are being diagnosed by physicians uh, sort of lag behind the peak in cases that we see among children. Um, the average age of Idaho children diagnosed with MISC is about eight and a half years, um, which is right in line with what um, other states in the U.S. are seeing. And more than half of the children with the syndrome end up becoming so ill that not only are they hospitalized, that they require care in the intensive care unit. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Um, so you'll be getting some updates from Sarah Leeds about pediatric vaccine rollout for five to 11 year olds. Um, but I was hoping to prime you for that discussion and sort of um, quantify the burden of COVID-19 in that age group. Um, Right now, roughly 7% of the COVID-19 cases reported each week during October were among children um, between the ages of five and 11. So while things are looking up right now and we are seeing declines in cases, there's certainly an opportunity to, um, for improvement and to provide additional protection to children and adolescents. And with that, I will turn it over to Sarah Leeds. Thank you, Dr. Turner. So today's an exciting day for us in the immunization program, as we are expecting a recommendation from CDC's advisory committee for the Pfizer-BioNTech pediatric COVID-19 vaccine for children ages 5 to 11 years old. This is, a, this is a significant step forward in our ability to prevent COVID-19 illness in children. We are also anticipating either later this afternoon or evening that the CDC director, Dr. Rochelle Walensky, will make the advisory committee's recommendation official. And if that doesn't happen today, we expect that Dr. Walensky's recommendation would come out tomorrow. Whenever that final CDC recommendation is issued, it means that providers will have the guidance needed to begin administering COVID-19 vaccine in children ages five to 11 years old. Like the Pfizer BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine for people aged 12 and older, 12 years and older, the two doses are administered at least 21 days apart. However, the pediatric vaccine for five to 11 year olds is a different formulation and doses, it's a different dose size as well um, than the vaccine for children 12 to 12 and older, for people 12 and older. Um, and it requires different storage and handling practices. So providers are advising that parents should expect that appointments for COVID-19 vaccines for five to 11 year olds may not be available until next week or at least later this week, um, as it takes a few days for them to receive their inventory, finalize their clinic procedures and train their staff on the pediatric COVID-19 vaccine administration. 
The Idaho, the Idaho immunization program continues to work with all of our enrolled COVID-19 vaccine providers and our local public health districts on pediatric COVID-19 vaccination efforts. In collaboration with our local public health districts last week, we pre-ordered pediatric vaccines in three waves. Our first and second waves of pre-orders totaled 36,900 doses. And we know that 23,400 doses have been shipped by the manufacturers to Idaho providers and our public health districts, and that 11,400 doses were delivered today. In that first wave of orders, uh, pharmacies that are participating in the Federal Pharmacy Partnership Program, which are mostly large chain pharmacies, they did not receive shipments. They will, however, have inventory tomorrow or later this week. The remaining doses from Idaho's um, waves two and three pre-orders will be shipped throughout this week. We expect that all of Idaho's pre-ordered pediatric vaccine orders to arrive in Idaho uh, no later than November 8th. We continue to work with each of our local public health districts as they redistribute many of the shipments of vaccines. These redistribution efforts are necessary because the minimum shipment of pediatric vaccine is 300 doses in this pre-order. Um, so our local public health districts are redistributing smaller amounts of uh, doses to many of the providers in their region. And finally, um, to, to find a vaccine uh, near you, a location near you um, that has pediatric doses, please contact your child's pediatrician. You can also visit vaccines.gov and or you can look, call your local public health district. And now I'll hand it over to Dr. Lisa Barker. Dr. Barker, if you're speaking, we are not able to hear you. I am getting my video connected. There we go. There we go. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Sarah. So as a general pediatrician, I have worked closely with children and families throughout the pandemic. And in addition to helping care for kids with severe COVID disease, I have definitely observed many burdens on families uh, that have been brought on by COVID-19. We've been particularly busy in the last few months as we've seen a rise in cases in young children with the surge in Delta virus. So it's been a bit of an interesting adventure. Um, it's really important to know that kids are not spared from the harm of COVID-19. Um, although severe disease is less common in this age group, we've seen over 8,000 children ages 5 to 11 hospitalized during the pandemic. Additionally, more than 5,000 children have been diagnosed with MISC which has been discussed already. And this, again, is a kind of severe multi-system inflammatory disease that uh, can make children very sick in the few weeks following what looks like a very mild COVID uh, disease. I cared for one young boy who had a very mild illness um, and then came back to the office four weeks later, extremely sick. And like many kids with MISD, required hospitalization and extensive treatment. Um, additionally, we do see long COVID in some children, about 7 to 8 percent of cases, where they will hold on to COVID symptoms for greater than four weeks. So it's not, it's not a, a no issue for these, this age group. Uh, vaccines have really emerged as the most important tool we can use to prevent severe COVID disease. Um, and I'm very excited about the likelihood that we will be able to offer vaccines to a younger age group. I've had the opportunity to talk to quite a few families already about um, concerns about the safety of the COVID vaccine in these younger children. Uh, most commonly, I'm asked about the risk of myocarditis, which is inflammation of heart muscle. Um, there have been rare cases um, observed in primarily older adolescents and young adults, and more commonly in the male gender. These things were identified as studies continued following people who are being vaccinated for COVID disease. Um, luckily, these cases have been shown to be mild and primarily self-resolving. And the data to date in the younger population has not shown this same risk. 
It's something that they will continue to monitor closely. And it's really important to remember that studies also show that COVID disease and MIS-C, for that matter, have a much higher risk of myocarditis associated with them, and the myocarditis that happens tends to be more severe. Um, so I'm excited. I'm excited about the clinical data um, that's coming out of the, the trials, and I'm really hoping that we'll be able to start offering this vaccine to our younger age group uh, in the next week to two. Thanks, Dr. Barker. Um, before we take questions from the media, I want to make sure I remind everyone that we do have American Sign Language Interpretation available today. If you search for interpreter stubs and hover over the three little dots in the window, you can lock it in place. So with that, we will now take questions from the media. Please raise your hand in WebEx or type your question into the chat area. And when I say your name, um, go ahead and unmute yourself and announce your name and media outlet before asking your question. And then uh, please remember to clear your hand when you're done. Um, our first question today is going to come from Melissa Davlin. Thanks, Nikki. I was wondering about the distribution of um, the vaccine, as, assuming that everything goes as planned. The distribution across the state, are you going to base it on population or are you going to look at the adult intake district by district and um, maybe make some assumptions based on that? Yeah, thanks, Melissa. I'm going to have Sarah Leeds field that question. Thanks, Elke. Yeah, so this is where our, our collaboration with our local public health districts really comes into play. Um, 63% of our pre-ordered vaccine that is coming into Idaho this week um, is going to be redistributed. And so we are continuing to work throughout the week with where those doses get redistributed. And um, they are making those decisions in collaboration with the pediatric providers in their region. And um, and so at this point, I don't have the exact total, but but we're working to ensure that this initial phase of ordering this week is distributed as is distributed as widely as possible. Um, and then again, um, regular ordering begins next week, and so those shipments will come in in doses, uh, minimum shipments of 100 doses, and so providers will be able to um, order those directly. Thank you. Okay, our next question is going to come from Betsy Russell. Thank you. I'm Betsy Russell with the Idaho Press. I'm not sure who to direct this question to, but I'm wondering, what have you all been hearing from Idaho parents about their willingness or their interest in getting their kids vaccinated with this very soon to be newly approved vaccine? Great. Thanks, Betsy. And um, I'm going to turn that over to Dr. Barker since she's the ears on the ground seeing patients and families right now. She wants to give us her perspective. So, unfortunately, I tend to hear from the primarily positive because people are excited and they want to know about it. So I hear less from the folks who are less excited. Um, but I am a parent of young children. Both of my kiddos are in the 5 to 11 age group. So I have a little bit of perspective from both working as a pediatrician as well as being a fellow parent in the uh, elementary age group. And, I mean, in general, I feel like there's a positive um, and excitement about it, a positive mood about it. Um, but I know that there is reluctance. I know uh, and speaking with a family yesterday, parents who were very willing and very excited to vaccinate themselves, but feeling more reluctant and more cautious about vaccinating their children. And I think that the, probably the biggest reluctance there is just because it's new and there's not the longevity of data that, that people would like to see. So I think um, as it rolls out and we have more and more opportunities to talk to people and educate, I feel confident that we're going to get um, a robust uptake, but um, it's going to take a lot of conversation because these choices are hard and we understand that for parents. All right, thank you. Um, our next question is going to come from Audrey Dutton. Hi, Audrey Dutton from the Idaho Capital Sun. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Great. Um, this question is uh, for, I think, probably 
um, Sarah Leeds. Uh, what's the timeline right now for the under fives for vaccination? Um, I'm, you know, hearing and reading all kinds of different things. What What's kind of the expectation there? Um, Audrey, that, that is a question I really don't have the answer to right now. Um, all of the work that we are doing with our partners and um, also our, our partners at the federal level at CDC, um, the focus has been on 5 to 11 years old for actually quite some time. Um, we've been talking about this since May um, and planning for it. And um, and we have not had conversations really um, at in terms of what what distribution would look like and when when that might happen. So I really don't have an answer uh, for that right at this moment. And I don't know if anyone else on our team might. Let's see if uh, Dr. Hahn might have anything to add. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Audrey. That is absolutely what we'll, as soon as we get this five to 11 year old thing, you know, kind of um, hopefully decided today if there's going to be a good recommendation and um, a positive recommendation from CDC uh, and a rollout that we will certainly be hearing more about that, I'm sure. There are clinical trials going on in younger age groups, I think as low as age two. Uh, but we haven't heard any timeline or dates yet, as Sarah alluded to, from the FDA or, or the manufacturers for um, actual um, authorization in those younger age groups. All right. Our next question is going to come from Brenda Rodriguez. Hi, everyone. My name is Brenda Rodriguez. I'm with KTVB Channel 7. Um, and I, I think this question might be for uh, Dr. Parker. Um, so you've answered uh, or you've talked about some of the uh, questions or concerns that parents, um, that you've seen parents ask. Um, we also talked to a couple of parents today and um, most of them, yes, have been really excited to get their children vaccinated. Uh, but two of the main questions that they brought up, um, and we talked a little bit about this, but I wanted to see if you had any others, um, was what are the long-term effects uh, for children? And also, why did it take so long to authorize this age group? Sarah, you want to go? Questions. So at this point, we we have, you know, the data that we have for the time that we have it as far as side effects. And there's there's no evidence of long-term effects of the disease, of the vaccine at all, um, similar to the adult data. Um, you know, certainly that's a big concern that people raise because we're limited by the amount of time it's been available and been tested. But what's really cool is if you look at the history of vaccine science, you can see that with every vaccine that has been created, any long-term side effect has been identified early on in the, the course of study. And so, um, you know, if, if we can depend a little bit on history and how vaccine science works, that's a reassuring thing. Um, my understanding, and Chris, Dr. Excuse me, Dr. Han may be able to answer this better, but that it did take a longer time because of some of the uh, the side effects that were seen in older patients, specifically the myocarditis, and they wanted to watch the data for a little bit longer and try to get a, a, a larger study group of data in this age group. So it was with extra caution that it took longer to roll out. Is my understanding. Yeah, Dr. Uh, Elke, with your permission, I will I will follow up on that and make a few more comments. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, that's absolutely right, Dr. Barker. I am uh, listening today to the ACIP meeting, um, and there's been a lot of discussion, a couple things. One is that the data so far in the 12 and above um, is very reassuring. So that's good to see that um, in that age population, um, you know, the rollout has been going very well. Millions of children in those age groups have been vaccinated, and obviously, um, it's a different age group, uh, but the expectation is they don't have solid data yet. You have, we have to acknowledge what we don't know. But the expectation is that the myocarditis incidence, uh, which is the biggest, as, as Dr. Barker mentioned right at the beginning, the biggest concern people have is expected to be lower. Um, most of the myocarditis that's been seen has actually been in the older adolescent and, and young adult male uh, and thought had something to do maybe with hormonal changes around the time of, of puberty. So younger children are actually you know, the, the, the scientists believe that, that we'll see less of that. 
Now, it hasn't been seen, but the studies, you know, we're not, we haven't vaccinated millions of children in that age group, so we, we can't say that for sure. So, and as you mentioned, sorry, Dr. Barker also, uh, yeah, they have enrolled, like Moderna, for example, is enrolling additional children. They, they are working hard to get enough children um, enrolled so that everyone is confident uh, as best they can in the results. And, you know, people want to get this out in time to help, but nobody wants it to feel rushed to the point that they don't have the right data. It's a very, very difficult balance. All right. Thanks, Dr. Hahn. Um, our next question is going to come from Hyatt Noramina. Hi. Um, I hope you can hear me okay. Um, yes. my, question, my question relates to um, MISC. Is there any pattern of children who have a, a propensity for it? Um, and, and could you give us a better picture of what it looks like when children are hospitalized with it, what symptoms they have? Yeah, maybe I'll um, turn to Dr. Turner first, and then followed by um, Dr. Barker. I'm grabbing the right people to respond. Yeah, thanks, Elke. Um, Hyatt, um, I guess um, your question about characteristics of these children, they're um, otherwise healthy kids for the most part. Um, we have not seen um, any um, difference in, you know, um, ethnicity, um, um, Geogra geography, anything like that. Typically, these are otherwise healthy children that develop these symptoms after an acute infection. But um, Dr. Barker's a clinician, so I'll turn it over to her to, to sort of talk through what these, these kids' um, symptoms look like. Sure. So I agree. My, my experience and my um, conversations with the folks caring for these patients in the hospitals, where, as well as our infectious disease specialists, is that there's just no way to predict who's going to experience MISC. Um, aside from we just know it's a higher risk in this 5 to 11 age group, and that's really the only thing we've been able to identify thus far. Um, as an example, the little guy that I cared for was six years old. He had a very, very mild COVID disease where he had a mild fever and some upper respiratory, like coughing and runny nose for a few days, was back to his normal state of health, and then about four weeks later came in with um, just sort of head-to-toe symptoms. So prolonged fever for several days that was reaching high levels, very red eyes, um, full body rash, very fatigued, obviously very uncomfortable. And when you look at his laboratory studies, you see evidence of inflammation throughout the body, elevated liver enzymes, um, elevated inflammatory markers that suggest kind of widespread inflammation. Um, and so these kiddos, in, for the most part, require support in the hospital with medications that help boost their immune response to this disease. Um, and so it does, and then some of them require additional support. But it's a, it's just a very interesting inflammatory response that we're still trying to understand in this age group. But it's not, uh, you know, we've seen we see similar things. Um, Kawasaki's disease is is an example of something similar that we still are trying to figure out what usually triggers that. We think it's probably some sort of viral illness, but we, we often don't identify what the trigger is, but it's a very similar type of process. So it's just important to recognize that the viral illness by itself is not the only danger to these little guys. And this is actually the bigger concern. And then the concern of sort of the long-term potential effects from those changes as well. Thanks, Dr. Barker. So I, I do have a question in chat. I'm going to read aloud. This is from Derek Kravitz. Um, he says, from the Documenting COVID-19 Project at Columbia University in Muckrock, um, given current ICU hospitalization beyond COVID patients, we would be seeking any additional information on the use of crisis standards so far, as well as transport log data to other facilities within Idaho and across state lines. Um, I, think, I think that is certainly a question that we can provide information to you offline office call. Unless, Dr. Turner, you have anything that you want to add? There's a lot baked, baked into that question. <laughs> yeah, LK, thanks. Offline, I think, is the best bet. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Our next question is going to come from Audrey Dutton. 
Thanks. Um, I had another uh, question for uh, for Dr. Barker um, and possibly for, for Dr. Turner as well. Long COVID, how much of that are we seeing in children? Um, you said between, I think, seven to eight percent of cases, but, um, you know, how, how much are we seeing in Idaho? Is it still seven to eight percent? Um, and what does it look like and which kind of age groups are primarily getting it and are they being treated? I mean, is there anything that can be done to help them? Great question, Audrey. And Dr. Barker, do you want to go first or? I, can, I, I honestly don't have a lot of data. When we look at the overall data, it's 7 to 8 percent of case of overall cases of COVID. My inclination is to say it's more common in adolescents than younger children um, because they tend to present in a more similar way as adults. The most common situations we're going to see is prolonged symptoms like fatigue, um, headaches, those types of symptoms. For some more severe patients, we're seeing, you know, ongoing respiratory symptoms or need for oxygen. Um, knock on wood, I haven't cared for any of these kiddos yet, but a lot of them are going to be followed by a specialist based on kind of what they're most often experiencing, and they're going to be treated symptomatically. Thank you. Dr. Turner, do you have anything you want to add to that? Um, I think the only thing I'll clarify, um, Audrey, is that um, long COVID is not something that we track uh, like we do cases of, of acute illness. Um, there are some um, areas in the country that are doing very specific studies to gather information and sort of characterize, you know, provide us population characteristics of, of these cases, but it's not something that we um, sort of, I don't want to, I don't want to discount it, but we don't, we don't count them in Idaho um, because it's a, it's a chronic, it's literally a chronic event. It's not an acute event that there's a public health action to be taken with. I would just add, it can be hard to um, clearly by individual cases too. I mean, there's, there's situations where we suspect possible long COVID in patients that didn't have a specific identifiable uh, case of COVID, and that's tricky too because some of the early, some some in, in the early uh, parts of the pandemic, it was harder to identify disease. We didn't have as much testing, et cetera, and so it's been a little bit of a tricky thing to fully identify. And I think we will um, be able to learn a whole lot more over the next year to two. Nikki, you're on mute. I muted myself and then started speaking. That's awesome. Um, so it, I have a couple of questions in the chat from two different reporters about booster shots. Um, the first one is, are we seeing an increase of residents getting a booster shot? The second one is, how many Idahoans have received booster shots? And then should they count on it taking two weeks to become fully protected? Great questions. Uh, Sarah Leeds, do you want to wrap both of those into one response? Um, sure. So if I can, let's see, the first question was how many Idahoans have gotten booster doses? And so we update that daily on our coronavirus um, homepage. And so uh, today's number is a total of 118,392 people have gotten their booster dose uh, here in Idaho. And the second question was, um, was it should about? We, should we count on it taking two weeks to become fully protected? Um, I would like to um, <laughs> say phone a friend. <laughs> Can we, um, Dr. Hahn, do you, I, I actually don't know. Um, I'd have to look up the answer for that unless Dr. Hahn knows it. The two, sorry, Sarah, I was, I, I just want to announce, Sarah, I was just listening, ASIP just voted, <laughs> so they just recommended the, um, or just, just passed, like, literally seconds ago, so, anyway, so I was just transferring back over, Sarah, was it the question about the two weeks to become fully protected, yeah. the last question? From yeah. The yeah, yeah, I, yes, I mean, it, it actually probably will be a little faster, right, you know, when our immune system is being boosted and it's kind of remembering stuff, it actually, 
Um, that's the beauty of it, right? The second time around, it's like, oh, I remember this. So actually, it probably is shorter, but uh, you know, to be um, to be safe, uh, we're recommending it. Hey, if you're if you're going to be at a big gathering, you're traveling for the holidays, uh, go ahead and get that booster at least two weeks ahead of time just to be on the safe side. But in in reality, um, most studies have shown that booster responses are actually a little quicker. All right, thanks, Dr. Han. Our next question is going to come from Rachel Cohen. Hi, Rachel Cohen with Boise State Public Radio. Um, I was wondering if Dr. Turner, I believe, can give an update on the school testing programs and just of the schools that received funding or testing supplies, do you know like about how many have their testing programs up and running now? Thanks, Rachel. Dr. Turner? Yeah, thanks, Rachel. So, um, yeah, well, it's different in every school, which is exactly why we started this program was to make sure that every school had the opportunity to design a program specifically for, for them. I can tell you that the schools that have received, um, that the, the funding is available, or the schools that have just needed testing supplies, um, and I say just, um, but they needed testing supplies to keep going, they have been having ongoing testing throughout. Um, there are some schools who are still in the um, kind of the planning phase and, you know, do we just do diagnostic testing now and then move into sort of a screening program? Um, there's also some schools that are looking for a contractor to come in and do full service. So I guess the short answer is that it's different in every school and different schools are at different places. It's, it's not a matter of when they got the money it's it's more about what their infrastructure was to start and where they are along that continuum of implementation. So there's no short answer for that. Thanks, Dr. Turner. Our next question is going to come from Melissa Davlin. Hi, I uh, was wondering, and this, I think this is probably a question for <laughs> Uh, Dr. Turner or Dr. Hahn. Um, I know in late August, early September, the state was projecting up to 30,000 new cases of COVID a week in mid-October, and we didn't hit that number of documented cases. Um, was the projection off, or were people not getting tested and some of those cases not be re being recorded? Um, what do you think happened there? Melissa, that is a question for Dr. Turner, so I'm going to turn it back to her. Yeah, thanks, Alki. So, um, Melissa, we love looking back at models and tearing them apart and determining how bad they actually were. So that's the great thing about models is we can go back and um, critique them. I, the models that were being shown back in August were sort of the worst case scenarios, um, and we did not hit the worst case scenario, which, um, knock on wood, is is great for all of us. You're absolutely right that the cases that are reported to public health are what we like to call the tip of the iceberg. Um, these are these are people who either sought health care, went in and got a test that was tested in a in a laboratory that reports to public health. There are probably a lot of people who are taking at home tests and never sought any care. Um, there are pe probably people who were asymptomatically infected, didn't know they were infected, and you know would have been counted as a case had they been tested. So. Um, so the, the answer is double. Yes, the model was projecting a little high, um, but I also think that um, the actual number of cases in the community is never going to be counted completely by, by public health reporting because we, there's just no way that we would know about every single case. So combination of those factors. But we, I mean, we certainly hit record levels and we certainly saw things we did not want to see in the last few months. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, along those lines, looking back at the model and then looking for, I'm sorry about the toddler, um, and looking forward for the future, are there going to be things about future projections that you change with that in mind? Yeah, so I'll just quickly follow up. So the, the modeling that is that is being conducted is being done by a consortium. It's, it's not something that they're not models that we own or we are um, constructing ourselves. And that consortium um, will take into account, for instance, now that the, um, apparently ACIP has recommended 
the vaccines for uh, five to 11 year olds, they might build that into the model. They'll probably model based on our vaccination rates that we're seeing in Idaho now. Um, they also might model what sort of variants start circulating um, in the near future, or maybe projecting um, different scenarios based on different variants that could start circulating. So um, those sorts of inputs will be brought into any models that are developed. I think we're we're getting close to um, probably a new projection being released in um, towards the end of November, early December for round 10, so. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, our next question is gonna come from Betsy Russell. Thank you. Elke, you said at the beginning that cases are going down in all parts of the state, but our hospitals remain strained. What is the situation in the hospitals right now, and what is the outlook as far as how long we're likely to remain under those crisis standards of care? Uh, thanks, Betsy. That's a great question. Yes, the, I mean, even though we are seeing those decreasing trends in cases, um, as I mentioned, the, the, the number is still high. We still have that high kind of watermark level, if you will, I keep referring to as that, um, which then translates into still that high flow of patients going into the hospital settings. Uh, definitely, there's a, a decrease um, proportional to the, the cases going down, but it's still that high level. So until that those cases continue to drop even further and our positivity, testing positivity rate um, declines a lot more, I think the, and, um, and remember we've talked about this in many press briefings past, that hospital employees are also members of our community, are also impacted by what goes on in communities. We're still operating, as I said, every county in the state of Idaho, except for one is um, classified as a community of high transmission according to CDC. So there's a lot of a lot of pressure still on, on the healthcare setting. So staffing sick, staffing out, um, cases still high coming into the hospital, continued pressure on the hospitals. Um, so we are still in crisis standards of care and, and the director is on. Um, just taking over his role today for the opening remarks, but um, certainly I can uh, turn this over to the director to talk about what then is, you know, what we're looking at for moving out of crisis standards of care, but we have a little ways to go yet um, with some pressure that needs to be relieved from the hospitals. And director, do you want to add anything? Um, thanks, Elke, and thanks, Betsy, for the excellent question. Um, I, well covered, and I would just add that we'll look for the things that hospitals had to do that put us into crisis standards of care as a result of so many patients. We'll look for those things to be essentially undone or to go back to normal to move us out. And that would be along space, which is um, you know, no longer using non-traditional or um, alternate space to care for patients. Um, as certainly in the ICUs, we'd be looking, many, many, many hospitals have converted uh, non-ICU space into ICU space, um, and we'll be looking for that to return to some semblance of normal. Uh, in addition, staffing. Uh, staffing has been overrun by the number of patients, even with the additional staff that have been provided by our federal partners in the National Guard. Uh, and so, as such, the hospitals are still running uh, nursing ratios that are not the community standard of care. They're running more nurses per patient than is normal. Uh, so we'll look at some of those indicators and, and work with our hospital partners to watch for those indicators to come back into uh, out of a crisis standard and into a normal standard of care. Uh, believe me, nobody really wants to be in crisis standards of care. Um, we are excited for the possibility to get out. It looks like we're headed the right direction. Uh, and so I don't necessarily have a time prediction, but we are watching daily what the conditions are with our hospital partners uh, and assessing you know, if we're getting close to that mark or not. Thanks, Director Jepson. Um, our next question is going to come from Audrey Dutton. Thank you. Uh, this question is, um, I'm not sure who it's for. <laughs> uh, how do the vaccination breakthrough rates for cases, hospitalizations, and deaths compare um, to rates for those previously infected? Um, and I know that there have been, you know, there's been studies um, published in the MMWR for Kentucky, and there's been, you know, conversations about what's happened in other countries and things like that. But since the public is receiving those rates for vaccinated individuals in Idaho, I think it would be helpful to, to know what it looks like in the 
in the post-infection group, particularly because there are groups and individuals telling Idahoans who were previously infected that they not only don't need vaccination, but that it would be dangerous for them to take the vaccine. Um, so do we have an idea of what of what those rates are or any idea when those might be published? I know that there, that was something that you've been working on for a few months now, but hoping, hoping for a little bit of an update. Right. Thanks, Audrey. Uh, a lot in that question too, and and that's what I'm, that's what I'm here for. As my job is to figure out who to answer the question. So no worries. Um, but I'm going to turn it to Dr. Turner, and then any follow-on from Dr. Hahn. Thanks, Elke. So um, Audrey, a couple things. It's it's a little hard. So unlike the vaccine breakthrough cases where we say this person is infected and got their vaccine um, eligible dose at least two weeks ago. That's a pretty easy calculation. With reinfections, we have to not only look back and see, has that person been reported before? How long ago was it that they were reported? Could this be a case of viral shedding? Could they have some condition that's causing them to carry the virus longer? Um, we have to look at a lot of different things other than sort of these binary infected, not infected, vaccinated, not, not vaccinated. All that being said, um, what I what I can tell you is that um, as of late August, um, approximately one to two percent of the cases that were reported in 2021 were reinfections. So no, people are not immune for life once they get infected. Um, and that yes, there has been um, a study released just last week that indicated that um, actually, if you get vaccinated, you're you get better protection against hospitalization and severe illness than if you are um, just um, going off of natural immunity. So um, we are looking at um, some ways to create algorithms to, to sort of get to the reinfection rate without the um, amount of manual review that has to be done. It's really hard to review 300,000 cases um, quickly. Um, so we're working on some code for that. Um, but I, I don't want to give you a time frame, um, except to tell you that right now we know that it's 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 somewhere between one and two percent of people are 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 reinfections. Thank you. And I would guess it'd be really hard too if if you have cases that aren't being reported. Uh, oh, absolutely. Either the first one or the second one. <laughs> yeah. And Dr. Han, did I hear you come on oh. to add something to it? Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, I totally agree, Dr. Turner and I have been talking about this a lot in the last few days. Actually, we've gotten a lot of questions on this exact topic. Um, and I wanted to um, I just put in the chat, and I'll do that right now, that the CDC just came out with a science brief. Um, Dr. Turner mentioned a study that has just come out. There is a lot of information coming out about this, and the science brief is a really nice summary. Um, it just got um, posted last week, and I'll just, um, if, if you haven't seen it yet, please take a look. I think it does a really good job. It's very balanced. It uh, acknowledges there are some studies that have suggested that natural immunity in some cases can be better than vaccine or more robust than vaccine-induced immunity. But as Dr. Turner pointed out, it is not predictable who's going to have a long-lasting um, immunity, and it is not uh, reliable. And not, and the, the way I keep thinking of it is you don't want to, get there. <laughs> um, you know, uh, once you've been infected and you you think you've crossed that bridge, um, might you might you have pretty good immunity? Yeah, at least probably, yes, probably in the short term at least. Uh, but standing here uh, in, in the front of the bridge and saying, do I want to go ahead and acquire natural immunity? You know, I, I would say that's a very, very risky uh, approach and we would not recommend it. There are, you know, not only the chance of the acute severe illness or death, uh, but long COVID, um, you know, some of the other complications, MISC, like we've been talking about today. So uh, we, when, we, when we get that question, we always wonder if, if people will misinterpret it to say, you know, let's go have a chicken pox party, you know, let's go, let's go get a COVID party because it's better to be naturally infected. We would never advise that because of the risks of the disease itself. Um, and uh, once you once you've been infected, though, we acknowledge that there is at least uh, three to three to six months. You know, there's different <laughs> uh, thinking on that, but there is at least a short term protection that's pretty durable, uh, short term, but probably not uh, long term. And we wouldn't want anyone to count on that. All right, thank you, um, Hyatt. Our next question is going to come from Hyatt Normina. Um, this is probably.
probably a question for Director Jepson. Um, could you tell us a little more about the process of getting out of crisis standards? How is it different than the way it was implemented? Um, are you going to be looking for direction from the hospitals to tell you when the state no longer needs to be in crisis standards? Thanks, Hyatt. Director? Oh, thanks, Hyatt. That's a great question and one that I think about every day, actually. So thank you for asking that. Um, the, the process for is, will be very similar to how we went into crisis standards of care. And just as a reminder of that, uh, the hospitals are the ones that are operating on the ground going into to crisis standards of care. We really looked for them to use the criteria that we have published that would say you've transitioned from an individual focus to a community focus because of lack of resources. And then uh, they would bring forward a request to activate um, going and that request would go to the crisis standards of care activation advisory committee. In the rule that we published um, coming out is just the reverse. So we would look for input from hospitals um, as to whether they're still in crisis standards of care or not. Uh, and I think it'll be slightly different, whereas in going in, we just look for a hospital uh, to raise their hand and then we would talk about is that impacting the region or the state. Uh, I think here we'll probably look at multiple hospitals to be letting us know uh, what their status is and where they are in, in the process of uh, having to, uh, you know, treat patients beyond the normal standard of care. So uh, we did have, we have had some conversation with the Crisis Standards of Care Activation Advisory Committee about what the criteria are that they'll be looking for to see if they're out of crisis standards of care. Uh, and really, I've described that earlier in this call, it's really just the reverse of what we saw coming in. Um, and so I won't re-describe that now. Uh, so I think we're all on the same page on that. So yes, we'll still rely on the hospitals for their input. Again, we're in contact with them literally every day. Uh, with what the situation is for each of them. Uh, and uh, when we think we're getting close to that point, we'll convene the Crisis Standards of Care Activation Advisory Committee, which I guess at that point should have been called the Deactivation Advisory Committee. Uh, they'll, uh, we'll, have a, we'll have a debate about whether it's time or not. They'll make a recommendation and then I'll make a decision uh, if it's time or not. So that's the process to come out. Okay, it looks like that was our last question for today, so we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Um, we are planning another briefing next week on Tuesday, November 9th at 2.30 p.m., so we'll see you all then. Thanks for joining us today.